we're, we're ready. Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, welcome to our makeup presentation. Um, I'm Laurel Peterson. I am the, the costumer at Linfield College, so I kind of do anything associated with the body. So hair, makeup, costumes, all that sort of thing. Um, and I think I've been there about five years now. I'm an alum from Linfield, too, so I came back. Um, and I had an assistant for the show. I designed the makeup for the show we're going to talk to you, talk to you about. And this is. And I'm Erica. I am a student at Linfield College. I am a junior, and I um, am interested in makeup design. And also, I do some stage management stuff. And um, I was the assistant makeup designer for this show. And I also was the lead student makeup artist. Yeah. So uh, this show was a fun challenge for us. So that's why we're presenting it to you today. Um, we did Night of the Living Dead. Are any of you familiar with the film of the same name? Mm -hmm. A lot of you. Okay, so it's a 1968 horror film, one of the early zombie films. It's black and white, um, mainly for budget issues. They could have done color, but it's a black and white film. Um, so one of the, the tricks of this show, it's like the movie on stage. Um, this film is in the public domain, so it is almost the movie script on stage. Mm -hmm. Um, and you want it to all be in black and white. That's one of the, the design things in, that's scripted in, in the play script. So that was a, a challenge for us just going into it. How are we going to make this happen? So that's most of what we're going to tell you about is, is how we did black and white on stage for a bunch of actors. So like we have up here, those are our challenges, turning an on stage group of actors into kind of a recreation of this 1968 black and white film. Um, we also needed to create a distinction between zombie characters. There's a lot of zombie characters on stage. And then there's also um, a group of live humans, we were calling them the non-zombies, um, that are held up in this house and trying to outlast the zombie horde. Um, and we didn't want any color on stage at all, so that goes for sets, um, costumes, makeup, it was all grayscale except for some blood in actual red coloring that punctuated the deaths of the, the, ty or the, the named characters, not just like lead characters, but any of the named characters that they died on stage, we punctuated it with, with actual red blood. Um, we had a few things we were thinking about as we went into this. Uh, we're a pretty small school. We don't have like a huge makeup program, so we had some logistical things to think about as we try to tackle a project like this. Uh, the scope of this project, the experience level of our actors, a lot of times they have to do their own makeup, so you know who's going to be putting this on, how can we achieve this with the people that we have. Um, the time factor is a big one for all of us all the time in theater. How much time do we have before um, they go on stage? How much lead time do we have before we get to this project from when we're cast to when it goes up? Um, and the products that are available, and then how much is it going to cost, right? I think we all need to know. Um, so just to go through some of those. We had a big cast for this show. We had a lot of zombies. There are 25 people on stage. We have a pretty small space. Um, really, we have a black box theater. So it was full of, of non-zombies and zombies, kind of the whole show. And they were all in grayscale makeup. Um, 13 of them were zombies. We had three dress rehearsals, which is pretty standard for us. We also only had three productions. This show also went up in two, two and a half weeks from when it was cast to when we did our first dress rehearsal, so it was a really short time. Um, this is actually a normal thing for us for our first show of the season. The goal is to do something really fast with a lot of new people. We're trying to encourage freshmen to get into the, the department. Um, our program lets kind of anyone be on stage who wants to, so it's not just theater majors and minors. Anyone across campus can audition and be in the show, so to encourage that, we have these sort of short, big shows, usually not highly produced. They are something we can do really quickly, really easily. Um, so this is a bit unusual. We did something a lot bigger and a lot you know, fancier, more bells and whistles for this, sh this short little time. So that was a big consideration. We had not a lot of time to prep. Um, and then the experience levels, like I said, we're encouraging new people to be involved in our program. So a lot of our zombies and even our um, named characters had no makeup experience. So that was a thing to deal with. Um, and then application time, we pushed it out to about two hours to allow to get everyone into to makeup. Um, some of it we ended up having um, done by the actors and some 
um, Erica did a lot of it, um, and then I was kind of running around making sure everyone was doing what they're supposed to. Um, requirements that we thought of we needed for this. Fast application, we have two hours, but we have 25 people, so it's not a lot of time if you divide that up. Um, we needed a full coverage makeup because we did not want to see any natural flesh tone. Um, and we wanted to have it simple for our newbies that we talked about and as much proof as possible because if you know actors are touching, rubbing, whatever, you're going to get that peak of pinky, whatever color, natural skin tone underneath. Um, we'll look at our research for a little bit. These are stills from the actual film. Um, the zombies in this film don't have a lot of 3D makeup, but I'll show you some other pictures uh, to really emphasize that. The first picture way over here are some of the, the non-zombies, still non-zombies. Um, this guy right here is actually a zombie, and you can tell you, he doesn't really look like maybe what you would think of a zombie character. So that was sort of an advantage for us. People have this movie in their mind, maybe, as they come to see the stage production. So this is a zombie, so we can play a little bit with how intense our zombie makeup is. Um, this is a horde of zombies that you see in the film, once again, the makeup isn't too crazy, not too outlandish. A lot is done with shadows and highlights, so that's sort of the vein we decided to go in to just make it a little bit more simple for our short time frame and our new actors. Um, these are some more intense zombies that are in the film. This is uh, the director here in the middle of the film <laughs> with his horde of zombies around him, which is kind of a fun picture. Um, but they're also like a, a little kind of funky looking. They're not as, um, I don't know, clean and fancy as some of the zombies you might see on like The Walking Dead. Um, they almost look like they've got sort of this bag thing over their head, so um, that gives us some room to play to, I think. Uh, these are products that we considered. When we were thinking about what to use for our grayscale makeup, we thought about things we were most familiar with. What I teach in my uh, makeup class at Linfield is mainly cream makeup. We use Ben Nye cream makeup for, for most of what we do in that class. We do a little bit of 3D makeup. Um, it's kind of an intro level sort of a thing. So we're pretty familiar with that in our department, so that was a consideration. Um, we branched out and started thinking about some liquid makeup products. Um, and then some cake makeup I've done a little bit with. I'm not super familiar with it, so it was like a quick thought, but then we decided not really to, to venture too far into that. And then some effects makeup that uh, is something we, we definitely wanted and had a little bit experience. So most of you are probably familiar with a lot of these products. We'll give a quick little rundown of what they are just so we all know and are on the same page. Um, we're most familiar with cream makeup in our department. You guys are probably similar. Um, it tends to be like the stage makeup, right? Um, it's a sponge application, which can be a little slow, especially if you haven't done it before, um, but it can be done by the actors. It needs to be set. It can get real smeary if you don't set it really well, and I find a lot of actors don't put enough powder on their makeup, like you really need the powder, um, and some people just don't do enough. Um, so that, that's something we were thinking about. Do we really want to do cream if we're going to end up smearing off some of our gray makeup? Um, Eric and I went to Hollywood Lights near us, which is kind of our makeup store. And it's an hour away from McMinnville. We're in a small town, so we have to travel a ways to go look at stage makeup. Um, but this one was recommended to us by people working there. It was a liquid makeup, something that would go on pretty quickly. Uh, we were entertaining the idea of using some sort of spray system to apply the makeup. Um, we played a little bit with a, um, a, like a, a spray gun, like a little small one. Um, and we found that it didn't apply very quickly. You could do some really cool details, but we needed to spray a lot of people really quick. So we ended up going with uh, this type of makeup, but adjusted our application a little bit, and we'll talk about that. We liked that it was fast. It didn't smudge so much in our tests. Um, we thought we could do a lot really fast with that. Um, like I talked about, cake makeup, I'm not as familiar with. I played with it a tiny bit, um, but it was a quick thought, and then we sort of moved on. Um, FX makeup, we, we stuck with the basics for this. Liquid latex and wax is, is what we were most familiar with, what we could teach really quickly to our horde of 13 zombies who had never done stage makeup before. Um, and we could make a few things ahead of time, but like we said, quick process. We didn't make a lot ahead of time. We had the actors do it themselves. Um, so we came up with a plan after all of this thinking and everything. Um, Erica's going to tell you a little bit about what we decided to do through this. Okay, so um, basically what we wanted to do was um, in order to avoid uh, using a ton of makeup, we wanted to 
cover, have the actors cover up as much skin as possible with their clothing. So, you know, making sure that they were pulling down their sleeves and just um, all of that. And then we really, as we said before, we really wanted to make sure that we were distinguishing uh, between the zombie and the non-zombie characters. And we did this mainly through using 2D shadow and highlight um, effects and thinking particularly about the amount and the placement of those. And um, we also wanted the zombies, especially those who did have a little bit more experience with stage makeup to be applying um, some latex or some wax wounds, you know, to help give like kind of a bit of a scary effect and also to help distinguish between the characters that we're speaking and the just the regular old zombie characters. And um, so for, um, we ended up deciding to spray their hands um, with liquid makeup gray base. Uh, and the reason why we didn't use an airbrush was because we found out that the, um, what was it, the valves or the like? We had like a hand-me-down one for, for starters, and so it wasn't very fast. Um, and it was also just really small. We were like, well, if we wanted to do a lot of fine detail, maybe we would use this. But I started researching some more and found out that sometimes people use just paint sprayers to spray makeup. It's like, you know what? That sounds fantastic. Yeah. So we bought a paint sprayer and we tested it on ourselves first to make sure that this was a good thing to do and it worked really well. And um, we just had to find the right mix. Yeah, exactly. And then we decided that the actors were gonna apply their own cream, um, their own cream makeup on their faces. And they were also gonna apply their own highlights and their shadows by themselves. And then um, I was gonna help them spray their hands and their arms if needed. Um, if their clothing didn't cover up, you know, their arms, I would spray further up to make sure that there was no skin and it would it was just all gray. And then um, also they, I would help them spray their hair or like a lot of people were wearing wigs. So if they needed to help pin curling um, their hair, I also helped them with that. And then we had them paint their nails gray before the performances. Um, to make sure because the paint, um, it would cover up your nails, but it wasn't, wasn't that great at sticking to, sticking to the nails. So then we decided to have them wear nail polish so that then there wasn't any issues with the paint coming off. Yeah, so they had a, a nail painting party mm -hmm. at rehearsal. Everyone yes. got gray painted nails. We yes. brought some with us. We just used like whatever gray we could find. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I had some. We used a shiny. They were covered in so much makeup that any shine was, was obliterated. I just used what we had locally. Um, if we were going to be more specific, a matte would have been ideal. But to be honest, we didn't see it. any of the, the shine coming through, so it was fine. Yeah, and so um, our main way that we prepared was um, I came in about a week or so before we started doing tech. And Laurel and I, we ended up testing out different... Um, kind of ratios for mixing up the liquid makeup. Yeah, because, this is what we use. Um, the liquid makeup that we use, this Mayron stuff, you needed to um, basically thin it down uh, because the liquid itself, the liquid makeup itself was too thick to go through the paint sprayer. So we it's a little thick. Like it yeah. probably would have worked, but it used up a lot of makeup really fast. Um, we got a lot of overspray with this, so this would be a caveat with using this thing. Um, we got a lot of coverage quickly, but there was overspray, so we probably wasted a decent amount of makeup, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but we had to thin it, as you were saying, and we used the Ben Nye Liqua Set. I know there's lots of different products you can use. This is what we had available in our um, Hollywood lights, and it worked really pretty well. We did find if our ratio was off, we got a little bit of cracking. So if you put too much liquid um, or Liqua Set in, it didn't get as even of a coverage. You got a little bit of kind of running and dripping. Um, and it just didn't last as long. Yeah, so we ended up figuring out that the best ratio was one part of the liquid Mayron makeup to mm -hmm. one part liquid set, and then we ended up um, we ended up creating these uh, makeup worksheets for actors, which you'll see a little bit later in our slideshow, just basically showing the highlight, where to place the highlights and where to place the shadows, and if they wanted. I uh, basically went to rehearsal a couple of times and kind of just asked all of the zombies that were there um, if they wanted any kind of, if they had 
I ask them to come up with a story for their character um, of how they died. And mm -hmm. then I created um, the different makeup worksheets off of how, um, how they died. So one girl, I think she said that, um, that like her wife ended up uh, biting her neck mm -hmm. and that was how she ended up dying and so I ended up creating a neck wound for her in designing her makeup so I kind of was able to get creative with the stories but also incorporate some of the actors own ideas into that so that was fun and then um, we practiced makeup with the cast before the first dress rehearsal so we had them come in one um, afternoon and we taught them all how to do the shadows and the highlights just so that they had a little bit of practice and that was helpful because like we said a lot of the cast had uh, little to no experience with makeup, so that was good that they got to learn a little bit ahead of time, so it was a bit less chaotic during dress rehearsals. Yeah, and we have a little picture. So this is the makeup chart. I think I did this one, but you did almost all of them. Um, and this is a really simple version. I find this actually works pretty well for newbies who have never done shadows and highlights. One, doing a tutorial day, and two, giving this super basic plot. Um, this is, of course, a zombie version of it, but... Um, we did, this is where the shadows go. We did grayscale, so I just used the pencil. Um, but circling where the highlight goes, I think is helpful. If you have a really pretty um, makeup picture, sometimes it's hard to see where the highlight starts and stops. Um, so we give this to them with the caveat that you need to blend this. It's not gonna look like this in the end, but this is where things should go. Um, so that, that was pretty helpful uh, for them. And then this was our practice without a gray base. Um, we were trying to conserve our makeup. We knew we needed a lot of it. Um, we thought they could probably figure out how to cover their face in a gray makeup, but um, they needed practice with shadows and highlights the most, so that is what you see in this picture, is practicing where the dark shadows go and where, where the highlight is gonna go on top of that. Um, and you had one more thing you were gonna talk about with the schedule. Oh, yes. Um, the spring schedule, that one? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, and then, um, Another thing that we did was before uh, dress rehearsal started was we created a spray schedule. So we kind of went through the script and found out which characters needed to be on stage first. And some of our uh, zombies also were helping uh, with our pass out concessions yeah, and uh, in the lobby and then also fun, pass out, it made it hard. Yeah, like pass out <laughs> programs. So they needed to be, uh, call time for most people was five o'clock, but those people needed to be ready by 625. But we also had warm ups at six. So, you know, we needed to really be strategic with our time since we had 25 people that needed to be getting into makeup. So we ended up splitting the group up into, I think it was four, uh, the cast up into yeah. four different groups and we timed it out where uh, we had two minutes to spray each people's, uh, each person's hands um, and then move on to the next person. And so the spray schedule, like it kind of ended up working okay, but then usually just people really kind of came up to me when they were ready. And yeah. it was, it ended up being a little bit chaotic, but you know, we were always ready before curtain. So, you know, that was good. Yeah, I think the schedule was really helpful for like the first dress um, and then people kind of found sort of a stride and a rhythm and we figured it out and it didn't go the same way every night, but everyone got sprayed, so it was okay. Um, and we also did a few blood packs, like I said, for some of the, the um, named characters who died on stage. There were, I think, two gunshots and like a knife wound, and so we did just the little um, like baggies of stage blood. You twist really, really tight and then tape on and they just like, hit themselves and it explodes. Really low tech, but it works pretty well. Um, and then we did a couple blood caps, someone gets punched in the mouth. Um, so we didn't die on stage, but we really wanted to emphasize that act. So um, they had a blood cap that the actor bit down on and then had a bloody mouth. Um, have you guys used any of those gel caps before? You guys know how those work? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I found that you can buy those at like health food stores, people who like fill herbal vitamins themselves and they're generally a lot cheaper than ordering them from Benai or another makeup supplier. So that's a, a good tip to, to use. Um, you can get them more locally and they're less expensive. Um, did you wanna talk about this one? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, so some discoveries that we ended up um, Yeah, through dress rehearsal. Yeah, through dress rehearsal is that it takes a lot of makeup to spray 25 actors each night. So we ended up having to drive all the way up to 
uh, Ben Nye, uh, or not Ben Nye, um, Hollywood Lights. Lights in Portland to go get more makeup. And um, it ended up being quite expensive because <laughs> stage makeup, as we all know, is not exactly cheap. So um, that, that was a bit of a challenge. And then another thing we learned is that um, cream makeup doesn't really like to go on smoothly over liquid makeup. And so at first we were gonna, instead of having actors apply the cream makeup on their face, we were gonna have, we were actually gonna spray their face as well, but through our kind of trial period that we, when we were testing out makeup before dress rehearsals, we found out that the, um, that the cream makeup over the liquid makeup would just smear it and it wouldn't stay in place. So then- it Kind of pulled it off almost. Yeah. Like the liquid makeup almost dries to sort of a powdery finish. So it sticks pretty nice, um, and it has this nice finish, but the cream over the top, if you don't just do sort of a dabbing, blotting technique, it pulls it off, um, mm -hmm. so it's not great. So yeah. you, can, you can make it work, but especially for actors who hadn't done a lot of makeup application, they were really struggling, so we just nixed the whole idea of spraying their face. And Plus, it was very ex we went through a lot more makeup than we anticipated. We did some tests and tried to figure out, this is how much makeup we're going to use, and we just like, blew way past that. So um, it saved us some money to do cream on the face instead of spray everybody everywhere, so. Yeah, and then another thing we learned was that um, any patch of skin that uh, didn't get covered accidentally by makeup would just, since the whole um, like stage was all gray, the costumes, makeup, lights, set, everything, um, it would just, yeah, you any just natural it. skin would just stick out and be orange, so. Um, so some solutions that we came up with was uh, to, in order to save some money um, with the spraying of the liquid makeup, we decided just to spray people, actors' hands and arms only. Um, and then we decided to, as I said, use cream on the faces uh, because the liquid makeup uh, didn't react very well with the cream makeup. Mm -hmm. And then um, for a solution of, you know, making sure that people got all of their skin covered, we ended up assigning everyone a buddy to basically check to make sure that all the actors got uh, behind their ears, their necks, make sure that any of their skin was covered by the gray makeup so that then it wouldn't stick out on stage. Yeah, back of neck and back of ears was a really common one for people to miss. You can't see that area very well. Plus, like, you know, natural zombie pose is like this, right? So if you didn't get way back here below your collar line that was just mm -hmm. glowing natural skin color, whatever that was for the specific actor, we tried to be pretty organized. We set up a little makeup table. I taped out lines of this is where all of this color gray is. You know, this is where the medium gray is, so that people could find things in our sort of madness of trying to get 25 people covered in gray makeup, um, that they could find where everything was. Um, the little bin over on that side was all the FX stuff. So the, the spirit gum, the liquid latex, all of those sorts of things stayed right there. Um, so we tried to be organized. End of the night was always just makeup everywhere, disaster, but we started this way. So I would recommend that. Be as organized as you can. Um, we kind of went through a lot of the products that we use, but these are the colors, if you're interested, that um, we ended up using with the cream makeup. I brought a few of them. Um, the Cadaver Gray was really a pretty nice one for anyone that's sort of in the, um, I know, it's kind of perfect. Um, in sort of the, the lighter skin tone, this was a really good one. Um, and then we used just regular old gray, it's slightly darker. Steel gray um, has a little bit of a blue cast to it, but it still worked um, for sort of like a medium dark skin tone. It also worked for a shadow nicely for, um, for someone who was starting out in a cadaver gray color. And then we also used coal, which is just a little lighter than black, um, for, for some darker shadows. Touch of black here and there, but mainly coal was like our darkest dark, and then just plain white, of course, for, for highlights for everybody. And those seemed to work pretty well. People did a little bit of mixing in between the grays to match value, and that was a tricky process, was getting the right value for all of our skin tones. Um, it's a lot of like squinting at someone in the mirror. I think that's the right gray for you. Um, but taking pictures just with like a cell phone and then turning it uh, black and white was helpful, and you could kind of see, took a picture of before makeup, and then with like a sample on and see if it blended. Or we also did like a patch on your arm of whatever gray we thought was closest to your base tone on a value scale and then took a picture and if it blended in seamlessly, then we found a good match. So we tried to be um, conscious of getting just the right gray for people. 
Um, we talked about the liquid, lace set, la liquid um, latex was a product we used and the liquid set. Um, we just used regular old translucent powder to, to set everything, you know, make sure not to use the one with like a peach tone. That's not good. Um, final seal everything. Zombies got a little sweaty, so we wanted to make sure everyone was, was set really well. Um, we kind of let the actors do a lot of their own FX stuff. Um, they played with it on our, our first tutorial day, and then we just kind of let them go crazy. The lighting was really low, so some of them were not seamless and, and beautiful. But um, it gave them like a gnarly look, you know, even if it wasn't perfectly blended in. Um, but the, the process that we went through, we'll show you in a little bit. If some of you haven't done the really simple scars and things with liquid latex, they've got some samples out here, and I'll, we'll show you in just a little bit how to do that. Um, the spray application was really kind of fun. Um, like I said, we used just a, a paint sprayer. So this is what we used to spray everybody. I just bought this at Lowe's, um, made sure it was very clean, washed it out um, before we put any makeup in it. Um, it came with this little bin to hold your makeup. We just hook on to the side. And we have a regulator to make sure our air pressure was correct. This little air compressor is what we use. This was a hand-me-down from one of my colleagues who used to do airbrushing. I'll hold it up because like some of you can't see it. So it is pretty old. It's like from the 70s or 60s, I think. Um, but it worked. And luckily, it would not give a pressure that was too high. For a makeup application, you do not want to have too high of a pressure because it can actually, like, impregnate your skin with makeup particles and that's not good so I've, I've heard that no higher than 35 we didn't go above 25 psi um, for applying the the makeup with the sprayer kind of like the 6 to 25 psi range is pretty good for makeup and that's where we stayed and this thing I don't think went above 15 so we we're very safe as far as that goes um, but we pre-mixed all of our makeup I think Erica, Erica alluded to that a little bit we just bought some bottles at Sally's um, that generally I think are used for mixing hair dye, but we put, after figuring out our, our ratios, the amount of color that we wanted and then filled it with liquid latex. So we had all of that set before. We had the horde come in and get ready to be sprayed, and then we could just refill our little cup as we went um, and, and get everyone, everyone sprayed down. So it was pretty simple, but um, having everything set up ahead of time was so helpful because it, you know, it's fast and furious when you're trying to spray that many people. So here's just an image of what it looked like backstage as someone was getting sprayed. Um, Antoine played the lead and uh, he actually did pretty well with putting the, the shadows, the cream shadows over the top of the spray makeup and so it was, it was fast so we continued to spray him. Uh, we had a, a, we mixed colors for everyone sort of individually and in groups if they overlapped in color. So we had a color that um, we would spray his whole body with, and then he got to do his shadows. This is what um, we had someone doing with the, the cream application. So this is through training. This actress learned how to do it really pretty smoothly. So we relied a lot on just the 2D shadows and highlights to create the zombie look. So a lot of heavy eyes, really gaunt cheekbones, um, some veining a little bit of times. The lights were really dim and patchy, so anything too finely detailed you didn't see. So we relied on just really heavy, big shadows around the eyes and the cheekbones to get a lot of that zombie look. So Erica was also in the cast in addition to, uh, to being our lead makeup artist. Um, so this is her putting on her stuff. Um, and then we have a little uh, what worksheet taped up in the, the mirror, and we did that for all the actors so they could see what they needed to do uh, every night. Um, and then here's just some more shots of people getting really fully covered. We tried to wig as much as possible. I know this is makeup, but hair kind of overlaps that a little bit um, because we went through a lot of hairspray to get everyone covered. Um, these sort of details were really fun. We didn't always see all of them on stage, but um, there are a couple moments where it, zombies lunged forward at the audience. So we tried to incorporate some of those like veining on the lips some crack lines on the lips, some cool sort of vein stuff around the eyes. So a lot of them got really pretty good at, at applying their own makeup. So here is some hair color. We used a face shield to protect the makeup. Um, we started out buying the, the Krylon color makeup. This stuff is actually really nice. It works really well to get coverage, full coverage on the hair cover up um, any, any color. As you can see, this actress here has this kind of bleached blonde, orangey look that's you know, a pretty bold light color but the black covered it up completely really, really well. Um, we used pearl gray and black mainly. Um, 
just so you guys know, the, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce it, it's like the schmutzen gray, it's like this German word for dirty gray, um, was not great. It did not have the great coverage and it was sort of a brownie gray. Um, so if you're wanting full gray scale, I would not recommend this one. Um, this stuff is a bit expensive. I think it was, what says, it was 950. Yeah, 950 a can. So it's good, but it costs some money. We ended up, because it was near Halloween, we went to Walmart and we bought some of the super cheapo $2 cans and these were great too. You just go through them real fast. These last longer. How yeah. many people could you get with one of those crowns? One of those? Um, I want to say about three heads of short hair probably. Um, these are more like one a person. So it's a little cheaper to use this, but you get some better coverage with that. Yeah. You mentioned before how you're trying to keep to 2D effects for the zombies. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in Living Dead before a long oh, yeah. time ago, so yeah. our makeup was very different in design. But yeah. the same principle, like how gaunt the cheekbones were and everything uh -huh. is, what problems did you have with like making it look like too skeletal or too like not realistically, if that makes any sense? Yeah, yeah. I think with the way the lighting was, um, it wasn't too like obviously skeletal. I would go around and help blend a few okay. times because there there was some of that very um, hard edge mm -hmm. situation happening between shadows and highlights. But like I said, there were a lot of people were very new, so we were making sure they were all gray. If things were a little bit on the hard edge side, most of the time the lighting kind of took care of it for us, which was really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but we went around and tried to help people blend because there were, there were some that they struggled, so we tried to help. <laughs> yeah. We only had three performances. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had. If you would have had more, do you think you would have gone with more permanent hair dye? Probably. Yeah, I probably would have asked people to dye to dye their hair more. Um, but it was such a short thing, and like I said, a lot of these people were from across campus, so asking them to dye their hair for such a a small performance was like, yeah, we can we can cover up with spray. Um, we tried to wig as many as possible. Yeah. Did you have to uh, like use like basic? Makeup like mascara or anything like that, or we didn't um, find that we had to do mascara. Just with the amount of makeup they put on, their eyelashes got pretty covered. Um, I think we had a couple redheads that we ended up having to cover. Um, that kind of showed up a little bit, having the more reddish tinted eyelashes. But other than that, not so much. What do you much. do if like someone has like sensitive eyes to where like like their just eyes just start running as soon as you like get close to their eyes with makeup? Um, that's something that you just kind of have to get get used to a little bit. Um, we just try to be really careful around people's eyes. I've had someone who like could not wear false eyelashes. It just really affected them. So we just went without. Um, if someone had that bad of a reaction to it, especially in a show like this where it is really dimly lit and I've got gobos and all sorts of things happening, um, I would just not put makeup around their eyes. You know, I would, we would just suspend our disbelief for that moment if that was like sort of a medical kind of an issue. Yeah. Um, the only thing Last question for the moment. Um, did contacts ever come into play, like to change a person's oh. eye color because of the fact, like, if someone had, like, really distinctively blue eyes, right. or green, like, did, was there something that was done, or was it just, what was that, just completely off the table and just focusing on, like, yeah, we Yeah, we just didn't even worry about that. Same with, like, the inside of mouths. Sometimes we're very pink, and we, we just decided that it, we didn't need to worry about that, you know? <laughs> um, if, if we wanted to be a little bit, if it was a longer run maybe, or we wanted to be a little bit more concerned about the eyes, we would have gone for context, but it was not a detraction on stage watching the show. We saw those little glows of skin peeking through, like that was distracting, and we found ways to cover that up and help people get better coverage, but eyes didn't seem to be anything that we really noticed too badly. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the wound process that we did end up doing. Um, we, like I said, kept it really pretty simple. Uh, these are sort of the, the steps that you go through to create a basic wound. I brought some of them in, the basic steps. Uh, so how many of you have made something like this before? A number of you, yeah. So um, you just use plain old liquid latex. It comes in any of the, oh, thank you, any of the Ben Nye kits, the, the larger like student kits that you get. This is the size that you get. Um, paint a little bit on a plane of glass or a mirror, um, let it dry, um, and then you can even 
cut this or um, kind of wrinkle up the edges and get something kind of weird and funky um, to get something more three-dimensional once you apply the liquid latex to the surface then you layer tissue on top of it uh, it's really low tech really simple so like bathroom tissue works fantastic you just want to make sure and separate it so you know this is just really cheap toilet paper um, that I've separated out so it's now one ply it has some harsh edges on it that would show through if you just put this down on um, the little puddle of liquid latex but if you pull it pull the, the harsh edges off and you get something that's really sort of amorphous and feathery. That blends in really nicely with your liquid latex. So that's what I've done here. I did about two layers of paper and liquid latex. You just alternate through liquid latex and the, the tissue paper. Um, to get something like this that sort of looks like a, an open wound, um, you do a little roll of paper. Would you be okay with like, passing that around? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let me finish explaining it and then I'll pass that around. Um, so you do like a little twist. I did two of these mm -hmm. and laid them down on the puddle of liquid latex and then put tissue on top of that and more liquid latex. This one here, we're starting to make sort of a bite mark wound situation. Um, and I just use my paintbrush to sort of sculpt into the layers of liquid latex to get that kind of teeth drag um, effect happening. So these are obviously made ahead of time. We also had actors do them directly on your, their skin, which you can do. Um, the only problem with that is liquid latex loves to grab onto hair. So, you know, we all have fine body hair, even if you don't have like really visibly apparent, there's little fine hairs. So liquid latex will hold onto that and it's uncomfortable to take it off. So this is nice to do it this way. It's done ahead of time. Then you glue it on with, with um, spirit gum and then you can put another layer of liquid latex on the top to sort of help you blend the edges. Um, you want to powder these really well. These are unpowdered, so they kind of have a tacky quality. I'll leave them unpowdered as we pass them around so you kind of feel that. Um, if I were to leave it this way and peel it, the edges would kind of wrinkle up um, and you wouldn't get a smooth transition as you applied it to the skin. So you would powder first and then uh, put some more liquid latex on top. So I'll pass that around so you guys can see what that looks like. Yeah. Did you guys end up trying Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we used a little bit of, of wax. Do you want to talk about some of the wounds that you made? Yeah, so we did, um, we also used some scar wax, like, sometimes. So um, I, like, helped some people make um, different, um, different, like, uh, wounds with that as well. And so it was kind of, like, a similar-ish process to the liquid latex, but, you know, that just went directly on people's skin and then um and then they would powder it and like put makeup over it so yeah and then some people ended up using like some fake blood in their um in the wounds that they made with the scar wax as well so yeah so the fake blood in the wounds did you use red or did you use like a black makeup or something no we yeah, we used yeah. black makeup, yeah. and then we went over it with a little bit of glycerin, so it gave that shine. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a question um, back there? Did you ever use, like, third degree or like silicone? No, we didn't do anything like that. I know, it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. I know, we, I thought a little bit about some of those, but um, like I said, we were, like, working with really entry-level sort of experience, um, so we kept it very simple. Let people, things that people could just play with on their own and not get too injured, really, you know? It's just like... Could steer it on, it's fine. Yeah. But the, the glycerin worked really pretty well. Here's a picture of one of them to create a grayscale zombie wound just over black cream makeup. Um, so, this is one I just actress did herself. There's a little bit of liquid latex peeking through, but oh, you know, zombie on stage, it looked fine. Um, but the, the latex gave that shine to make it really look like something gruesome and gross. And if you were to make blood in a black and white, situation, um, but black worked pretty well. So here's another actress with a zombie wound that she she made. I think she ended up putting a little bit of shine on top of that afterwards, but that worked pretty well. I think that one she just did with liquid latex. Um, so here's one of our non-zombies. We talked a lot about zombies, um, but this is Barbara backstage getting all made up. You can see her arms are sprayed up to her elbows. She had a, a coat that she wore for the whole show, so um, we didn't have to spray her whole arm. Yeah. I'm just interested, why change Barbara from a blonde to um, having a 
black wig? That was the wig we had. <laughs> it's an easy answer to that question. Yeah, um, like he's, it was a quick run. We were using what we had. I think I ordered a few things, but um, I had a black wig. It looked cute on her, so I changed it to black. Um, so there she is on stage with her, her gray. Um, they blended in really pretty well. It was fun to see the first photographs from dress rehearsal, and it looked like a black and white picture. So that's kind of when you knew it's like oh, it's working. It's working. <laughs> Um, so here's another shot of everybody on stage with the whole thing. You get some weird colors happening just because of the production, uh, projections through photography, but it was a black and white projection when you were with her in person. You mentioned before smudge, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, you mentioned before that you wanted to be careful of not smudging the makeup with mm -hmm. actually touching things. For the hands and arms, since all the furniture, like Barbara's on the couch, and like there's all the fighting that goes on, Yeah. how... Did you do anything to the set as well as sealing on the actors to make sure that there wasn't really any makeup left on the set? Or how did, I, I'm just curious about Yeah, that. Um, we had people just kind of do a walk around and make sure there, there wasn't anything left that was gonna transfer to costumes. Um, but we didn't find that there was a lot of smear happening on the set. Some of the hand props got a little smeary. The, um, the liquid makeup that we, used, like I said, kind of dry to this velvety finish. So it wasn't gooey like a cream is. So when it smears, it kind of leaves this, this residue behind. It more flaked off when it did come off. So it didn't transfer to a lot of other items, which was nice, but it still did um, break off from hands a little bit, just from people grabbing props and each other and fighting and doing those sorts of things. So um, it was not a perfect makeup for this, I would say. It worked well, we, you know, we made it through, we did the show, but um, I think there were other products out there that might have worked a little bit better, and we have a, a little section on that at the end. So you can see curtain call with a lot of zombies and non-zombie people together, and then the, where the blood pack exploded on the guy's chest from the, the gunshot wound. And the, the mouth, too. Uh, the little girl that eats her parents. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, with a spade. It's, it's very fun scene. Yeah, fun scene. Um, but I mean, it looks a lot like a black white image. You can see where things are rubbing by the end of the show. Like I said, you get that the flaking with it was a bit of an issue. So uh, it was not a perfect makeup for this. So I will say that. Um, in the next zombie apocalypse, um, things I would like to try would be body paints. Like um, I've heard paradise paint it works really pretty well. Um, I have not tested it, but um, that's something that I've heard works nicely. So like I said, if we were to do this again, that would be an avenue to try. Um, and then I've heard of the, the aqua color being uh, kind of successful for, for airbrushing. The paradise paint is not something you would do with a sprayer. It's like a, a little tub that you activate with water and, and smear everywhere. Um, and then we would probably prep more liquid, liquid latex appliances. We were doing a lot of figuring out for this. Um, doing a whole grayscale show, we didn't give ourselves enough time to do sort of the prep liquid latex things, so we let the actors do a lot of it. But to save them a little time, we probably would have prepped more of those for them um, ahead of time to just save them a little bit of, of on-demand zombie vine. Any questions about any of this before we do any tutorial thing? Yeah. How difficult was it getting the makeup off? Because I'm assuming, like, <laughs> like, because, like it's like very distinct like layering of the makeup and like the latex so like was it just like a special process to remove it all off of the actors or like was it just simple makeup wipes? Yeah. Um, we, we have a process that we go through for any show but we really emphasized it for the actors in this one because there was so much makeup. Um, a lot of actors will ignore my suggestions of the process of wiping off, of taking off makeup and we'll just use makeup wipes. Um, which is fine, it gets it off, but it's really not getting it completely out of your pores. So if you want to describe the process and yeah, so how it worked for you since she was in the show. Yeah, so what you're supposed to do is Laurel recommends that you take cold cream to remove all of the makeup and then use a, uh, like a simple face wash soap, like any of them really work, and then wash your face, and then you want to use some either witch hazel or toner to, um, you know, help get all of the gross stuff out of your pores and then end it off with moisturizing. And 
I did not always follow her suggestions, and I had some nasty breakouts the next week from not being in the show. And, uh, yeah, like, another thing, too, was that, you know, I feel like being in the show, I would take a shower every night, and then the next morning I'd wake up and my pillow would be gray, and then I found out that I, you know, missed some spots on the back of my neck or behind my ears. So it was kind of just the constant struggle of finding gray makeup on you. So, you know. Yeah. It was fun. But I find that, um, I mean, cold cream has just been around forever, but it really works well to loosen up the cream makeup. So I advise that the actors use that, even though they always say, it's kind of gross, um, to put that all over wherever the makeup is and then use the wipes to wipe that off or provide, um, you know, washcloths if they want to use that instead of a makeup wipe and then face wash. And uh, like she said, then some toner and then moisturize. The moisturizer is a really key thing to help breakouts because you're washing your face so um, intensely, maybe more so than you're, you're used to doing. It can be really drying. So moisturizer is a, is a big thing. Um, and that's, that's where people get break out, breakouts if they don't go through those steps really well. But similar process of washing anything else off. It's just bigger because there's more makeup everywhere. Uh, we have showers in our dressing room. Um, so we, <laughs> your face. <laughs> um, so we had actors who would utilize those to just, you know, get it all off right there in the theater instead of trekking across campus covered in gray makeup. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions about any of that? No. Yes. Um, did you ever have uh, issues with uh, like makeup uh, getting on costumes? And stuff? Oh yeah, I was everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we mopped the floor in our dressing room nightly because of the overspray factor. Um, we had to institute a uh, sink washing schedule because there was gray everywhere. And when everyone is covered in gray makeup, it just gets everywhere. Um, and people were rushing about, so they weren't being careful with touching things. So um, yeah, there, there was just gray all over the place. So we just had to make sure that we ended up taking care of it by saying like it's your night to stay behind and wash out the sink instead of having wardrobe do it every night so kind of take care of each other a little bit so that's sort of how we dealt with it but it was just messy it was just gray all the time after the show closed we went around during strike and wiped all the walls because there was gray all over the walls um, maybe not super apparent but you can see little fingerprints here and there so we tried to try to clean up but yeah it was messy it was fun but it was messy. It was also very expensive, so I will give you that caveat. I don't. You said you did the show before. I don't know how much you ended up spending on makeup, but we spent a lot of money on makeup. Um, it was like our year's budget of makeup on one show for three nights. So I don't think I would do it again. <laughs> uh, so it was one of the things I was interested in bringing to you guys. Like this was a crazy experience that we had. It was really fun, but these are things we would change. And it was expensive, so you should probably know that if you want to make everyone gray. It just takes a lot more makeup than you think it's going to because you are switching skin tone. So same if you were to do you know, a green witch sort of makeup, it takes a lot more cream base to cover up um, whatever your natural skin tone is um, other than a natural skin tone sort of makeup, like a corrective makeup, where if you've got a little bit of bleed through of your natural skin, that's fine, you know. Um, you're not going to see the difference, but if you want complete grayscale or complete shift of any kind, it takes a lot of makeup. Um, we'll go over a little bit of, of technique uh, next. We'll try and do some gray um, to just sort of see how much makeup it takes and, and how you would do that if you guys are interested in seeing that. Um, how many of you have worn cream makeup before? A lot of you. Who would like to wear cream makeup right now? Oh, your hand went so high. Come on down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason why I asked if you had worn it before is I don't want anyone to react to a makeup product wearing it the first time. That would not be great. Um, so I showed you some of the products that we had used. Uh, we'll probably use a cadaver gray for you. I bet that would be a good match. Um, we, for our, for our shop, we tend to have sort of community pots. That sounds bad. Um, but pots of makeup that we scoop out of and then put on a palette. Um, instead of having to sanitize the same pot afterwards, we do do that at the end of the run. We try to scoop makeup out, and that is your palette for the show. You can dip in and out of your little palette as much as you want, but only clean spatulas go into our, our little pot. So um, everyone kind of does that differently, but that's, that's the way we like to, to go about things. Um, so I'm going to try and do maybe just half of your face to start out with. We'll see how much time we have. Um, just sort of a full coverage of gray and go over some different techniques so you can see 
how you might have to adjust if you were to do something like this. Um, I'm just going to defend it out of the pot for today since it's just you. <laughs> I'll sanitize things later. Uh, we just use these little rubber latex sponges. Um, let's see. <coughs> oh, yeah. I can. Let's see. Maybe if you spin a little bit that way, people can, can see this side of your face. You guys kind of see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. All right, so like I said, this is the Ben Nye Cadaver Gray. The number on it is P15, if you're interested. So just sort of load up the sponge really well. And then um, for the first go round, you can sort of do a little bit of, of a pull. When you start to, to pull on makeup, it kind of lifts it a little bit. I find that a padding motion really is the most successful. It provides the most coverage. And if you have some pores, it will push it down in there a little bit. Um, but it gives you a better coverage instead of pulling makeup off that you've already put on. Especially if you feel like you've got a start of makeup, but there's maybe some streaks happening. If you keep doing this sort of pulling technique, you're just going to keep lifting it off. So that padding technique um, really helps you block those in get sort of a full coverage here. So when we were doing this, of course, we were going down their, down their neck. Um, we used cream for most of that. We started out with the, the spray and found that it, with the movement of their head, you would start to get maybe some little crack lines happening so the the cream works pretty well as long as you you have to remember to powder mm -hmm. really well especially anywhere where you get a lot of flex um, eyelids especially if you're putting it there and then like for this show if you're putting it on the back of your neck where you get a lot of head movement you're going to want to powder that really really well I mean really everywhere but those are areas you want to be particularly conscious of so just by doing this sort of padding thing you get pretty good I have makeup wipes, don't worry. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be your look for the rest of the day. Oh. Out. Theater badge off. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay, so uh, we'll do some shadows first. Um, I generally do shadows first. I know some people do highlights first. I kind of tell people that it's however your brain works. If you think and highlight first, then do highlight first. But if you um, do it the other way around, that's perfectly fine. And if you guys have questions as we go through, that's, that's great. Um, yeah. So, how come you didn't put gray on the entire half of the face? Do you just like keep um, shadows and contrast everywhere? Or is it helpful not to smudge the makeup and control it more? We, sorry, say that again. So, like, I thought, well, why didn't you put um, cadaver gray on the eyelid? I, I will. I'm going to start with the um, the cheekbone shadow first. I'm just trying to be conscious of time. I don't want us to run over. We've got a bit of time left, but okay. um, yes, if this was going to be a full application, if we're doing the show. Um, like we did it originally, full coverage all the way down. We put it like up in the hair. Um, I'm just trying to do little samples here. And also I don't want to get it up in her hair so she can run around and do the rest of her life today. This um, is my life. This is your life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I'm concerned. You're, you seem down for this. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, same sort of thing like we just did to get a good even coverage. I do a padding motion when I start to um, apply the shadows and the highlights, that works really well for blending too. Um, if you need to do sort of a stripe thing to block out where your shadows are, um, then that, that works. You just wanna probably go over it with sort of this padding technique after, the, after that first lay-in. Um, and I let tell my actors that they can be really bold with their shadows initially and then worry about the blending afterwards. A little bit of makeup is always better than too much, but if they need to do like this stripe to really figure out where their shadows are, then you can go over it and blend it later and it's fine. Um, so if you are struggling finding a cheekbone, that's something that a lot of, of my new students struggle with. Um, if you do like dark room flashlight over your head, you can really see where your cheekbones are. That kind of extreme lighting will help you find those features. Um, 
Um, but I can see hers pretty well right here. We've got this, this high ridge right there. So I'll sort of map it out with the edge first and then go in and blend. So while you're applying the shadow on, how does it not like smudge away with the gray? How does it like, still stay with intensity with the shadow? How does it still stay? Yeah. I find that that padding thing works really well. If you keep pulling it, you start lifting off that gray. So as I dab at it this way, it's kind of pushing it back into the gray base below without lifting that base gray off. So you kind of see as we sort of just go over both the top and the bottom edge of that little sort of triangular shape that I put on, it kind of settles it back into the gray without creating some patching that can happen if you start to pull. And that's something that um, I find people who are getting frustrated, really struggling with applying their makeup, is they're doing this pulling thing and lifting off everything that they apply. Um, and I find lighter layers work a little bit better than um, heavy, heavy application with the makeup. It starts to get really muddy and kind of thick. Um, I've had a few people that that's for some reason where they want to go. They want to keep just laying on the makeup, but subtle layers tend to, to just blend a lot better. It's sort of this back and forth kind of a, a dance. So if as you blend it in, it might go away too much. You can always put another layer on top. Um, sometimes people get frustrated after they've put on the shadow and they blended it in, and then it's not as intense as they want it. Just, you know, just put another layer of makeup on. It doesn't take a lot um, for your second application to get a deeper shadow. Um, but you just might need a little bit more than what you had before. Any questions about any of that? No? Is all pretty familiar with you guys? Yeah? Is there anything in particular that you would like to see from what we showed before that you're curious about? Yeah? Blending of highlight and shadow. Blending of highlight and shadow? Sure. Um, so beyond, with the highlight in addition and blending that back in, that's what your question is? Yeah. Okay, great. So it's really similar to doing the shadow. I find that no matter what makeup color you're doing, so if you're doing whatever your natural skin tone is, or you're you know, turning yourself green or gray, um, leaving space between your highlight and your shadow is important. Um, if you start to overlap them too much, it kind of muddies it. You want a little bit of whatever your base color is in between the highlight and the shadow, and you blend those into the base and then you get this nice gradation happening instead of sort of this muddy middle um, and then a light and a dark on both sides of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll try and do that up here. So I've put her, the bulk of her shadow right here. So I've got some space above on top of her cheekbone to add a little bit on top. So does the highlight in the shadows just kind of like shape the face or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, if you haven't done any makeup before, we'll do a little bit more blending. What? I've never even done my own makeup. Okay. Yeah, yeah that looks great. Um, so the highlight and the shadows, the goal of those um, is to bring sh kind of sh the structures of your face mm -hmm. back out on stage. Stage lights are really flattening. Yep. Um, they're super bright, so they can make your face look not as dimensional as it normally is. And we want to see the actor's face. Um, they're using that to act. The audience really wants to see what they're doing with their face, so that's why you do the shadows and highlights. Anywhere where there's a recess in your face, so below your cheekbones, underneath your jaw, um, the, the uh, sort of temples, the sides of your head, uh, sometimes the sides of your nose, you wanna add some shadows there, and then anywhere where something juts out, so like on top of your cheekbones, on the top of the jawline, um, the center of your nose, if I didn't say that, your forehead, um, you wanna add a little bit of highlight, and the combination of those shadows and highlights reinforces the three-dimensional features of your face. So you can just really see, really see them on stage. So that's why you do that. And um, if you're researching a grayscale makeup, um, sometimes you'll see some that maybe people have done for Halloween that aren't familiar with stage makeup and they just do a gray. Um, it is really flattening to just have that gray put on and no shadows and highlights with it. Um, it's there's a really big difference between seeing something that's just gray and then seeing one where someone has done the shadows and highlights on top of it. 
So um, you might think, oh, I'll just you know, put, put gray on my face. Same goes with like a, a green witch makeup. I know I keep using that reference, but that's one that I see often that people will do in my makeup class. They want to do a, a green face uh, witch makeup. Um, and they think they're done if they just do the green, but you need to put those shadows and highlights on um, in order to bring the, the dimensions back out. Yeah? Is there sort of like a, like a guideline for um, different colors of uh, shadow and highlight that you do for different like base colors? Because like for example, if you're doing like a really pale like ghost or like mm -hmm. type of look, you can't use like a warm brown for like contour. You use warm one, right? right, yeah. You want to stay sort of in the same color family most of the time. I guess it depends on what your end goal is. Um, you know, using your research images and then whatever your design is. I mean, you could have a pale sort of face with some worn shadows if that's the look you're going for. But if it's not, then staying within the same hue and then picking different values on both sides of whatever your midtone is or whatever you decide the base color is is, is how you kind of stay true to that, that one hue. Does that make sense? Yeah, so like if you're doing green, you would pick a very, very dark green um, to, to get the shadow and then either a lighter green or a white. Yes. Sorry, you first. Yeah. So if you were to try to do a different color that, again, is not green, because green's been done the opposite. Yeah. Like purple. If you uh -huh. were to try to do like a purple face, would you stay within like color threes as purple, red and blue, like having dark blue for shadow and like pink for a highlight? Or would it just be like golden, like black and white being like the shadow and highlight? I would tend to tint them um, a little bit. Um, I would stay within that same hue and then do tints and shades of that hue instead of just black and white. That might mean you are using black and white to get those colors, okay. um, but I would start by introducing those hues into the shadows and highlights before just going to black and white. Um, and it just, you know, you gotta test it and see what works. Every makeup color is a little bit different. There's different pigments to make up that color that they've you know, used in creating it. So you'll find maybe that there's this dark blue pre-made that works fantastically, um, or maybe you just have to make up your own. I tend to mix colors a lot, so I would, I would probably end up mixing something. Sorry, you had a question Did too. Did you guys do anything for the non-Bobby characters as far as like trying to <coughs> simulate blush? You or know what, we, the way that we kind of got a little bit of that was how the, uh, the shadows were sort of blended and, and contoured up. We just got a little bit a little bit more of a rounded cheek almost for some of the, the women and um, pulled the shadow just a little bit higher, but in a very gentle gradation. So it was more of sort of this apple cheek thing that, that we ended up doing for some of them. Um, but it, it wasn't really um, a necessary thing. If I was gonna put like a gray powder on their face to do blush, I think it would it would just look sort of like a smudgy soot yeah. sort of a thing. Yeah, yeah, um, just with a little bit more of that kind of shadow rendering effect, they looked made up even though they were just wearing the gray makeup. We did do um, darker lips to, to kind of be a, like a red lipstick that would have been in a black and white, yeah. And actually looking at black and white films was really helpful for this. You know, someone that you know was made up in sort of traditional makeup uh, methods with like blush and and lipstick and those sorts of things and then seeing what that looked like in black and white yeah yeah is there another hand up over there no yes you're good okay um we'll go back to what we're doing here i think you're pretty well blended we've got a little bit of a, a thing right there how much time do we have like yeah yeah we end at 20. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're checking your makeup, I find it is really helpful to look in the lights and your mirror. Um, I have students that will want me to check their makeup and then like will turn around and look at me. I want to see it in the mirror and on, in the lights of, of the makeup station. Um, it helps kind of, it gives me distance to see it in the mirror um, and it also has that lighting effect that um, that theater lights would have a little bit, not quite the same, but just the fluorescents aren't really as helpful. I don't know what all of your makeup rooms look like, but we have fluorescents and then you know lights at the stations. Um, so that, seeing that in the mirror is, is helpful. Uh, we also have like two banks. I'll have the students turn around and look in the mirror behind them to see if their shadows and highlights are reading from a distance. Um, so either just using your, your own mirror from a little bit of 
of space or, you know, stepping way back and, and using one that's behind you or something like that is helpful. So that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm checking to make sure. If I get too close, then uh, I can't see what it's going to look like. Pretty good. We did go a little bit more intense with our shadows and highlights than maybe you would for like a basic corrective for the zombies. We tried to give them a little bit more of a heavy contour. You can tell them about your process when you put makeup on yourself too. That might be interesting for them. Oh yeah, so like when I, I like as a zombie, we kind of um, used a little bit more of like a, Laurel, how would you describe the shape of the zombies, <coughs> but just kind of like, it was more accentuated to like, um, to like very, define the cheekbone so it, kind it was of almost like, skeletal like you were yeah. kind of saying that the, that's sort of what we went with just to automatically give you that distinction between this person's a zombie this one is not right so it wasn't like the you know more traditional just going kind of like blending down the face it was kind of more of like we started like a, kind of a little higher up and then like went out and then kind of like down and like more of a curvy shape to kind of accentuate the skeletal features and then um, you would just kind of blend down and then you would um, do the same thing by putting highlight you know just above that and then blending do back anything right after. so that was kind of the do main, thing, you need to be right after. Uh, okay. main difference with so the zombies so similar but you. Okay. you know that way you were able to tell the difference kind of between the main characters and then the zombie characters and then if, and then the zombies also had obviously the darker eyes and then the more features you know that the little features that we had like the lines on their lips um and then um the different characters the different zombies could do their own special effects like one of the things that i chose to do for my character was um was to give it a black eye so that was kind of fun and that was also kind of interesting trying to do that with the grayscale makeup and so i used a stipple sponge with that and um, was able to use a mix of black and white with the stipple sponge. Do you mind if I go over your eye? <laughs> blending that together to make that, to give that look, so. All right, so I'm gonna go over her eye now. I think we've got a little bit of time to do that, so I'll try and do sort of a hollow eye and maybe a little bit of um, wrinkles around that we use for the zombies. So when you're doing someone else's eye makeup, you wanna be really gentle around the eye area. Um, we talked about that pulling thing that tends to be just an automatic for a lot of people. You really don't wanna do that on someone's eye, especially on the under eye. It kinda of stretches the skin a little bit in a not great way. So gentle little padding is a better idea. Can you look up for me? their eyes closed you can't really get under the eye so I'm gonna sort of sneak up to her eye be very careful that was another thing that we kind of had to sort of suspend our disbelief you have the waterline pink and we um, like I said a lot of new people so they were that just feels weird to have your waterline colored mm -hmm. so we just decided to to do without Right. So we are going to be covering most of this area with a darker makeup to get that sort of sunken eye look. I still like to put a base down of whatever base you're doing, um, even if you're covering it with a different color. It's easier to blend into a base makeup than it is into skin. Um, so getting that, that coverage first is really helpful. Um, if you're doing a large area of shadow or highlight, the sponges work really well. But when you start to get more detailed, then brushes are what you wanna do, but we're gonna do some dark first. We also were conscious of the shape that we were creating for the shadow of the eye. Um, we were thinking about the character of the zombie, all the actors you know, had either a backstory or some sort of characterization for their zombies. So if they were had like more of a furrowed brow, then we were taking that into consideration as we were putting in the gray. Okay, I'm gonna 
brush and we'll do the rest of it with the brush. What? Um, when oh, you, thank you. Thank you. Would you apply anything to the eyebrows or was the base makeup enough to? We would use the cream makeup or um, an, a black oh. eyeliner pencil to, oh. to go over the eyebrows. Yeah, because I mean, you can push the cream makeup down in there with just the sponge, mm -hmm. kind of, but it tends to float <coughs> on top of the hairs a little bit. So you can yeah. work it in better with a brush and cream or use a pencil and go in and do it that way. So that is something that we ended up doing. We'll incorporate a little bit of that in here. So we are trying to find a really quick sort of thing for new actors to do. So darkening the whole eye area worked pretty well. And then using the brush to get some interesting creases around the eye. So creating sort of this furrow across the bridge of the nose was really effective. And that's something they could do really fast. Um, so I start with the brush in the, the eye socket by the side of the nose. And then do sort of a quick pulling motion and pull off to get in a nice thin, thin point at the edge of the wrinkles. I find that uh, brush handling is one of those skills that we end up practicing a lot with. People haven't done a lot of painting or art sort of things in makeup class. So the um, inside of the eyelid, right by the nose, the brush is like to the nose like that. Mm -hmm. What exactly is the effect you're creating for it? Because I'm familiar with like brushing mm -hmm. underneath the eyes, mm -hmm. like, you know, darkening, but like why on the nose like that? It gives kind of like this wrinkled sort of like aged sort of look. So if we're doing sort of like an older kind of zombie, it just sort of furrowed the brow. It gave another characterization to the face. Um, so you, and most of you can make that face if you want to. It kind of, you know, you can wrinkle up the center of your nose. Um, so it just looked really, like it was an immediate um, distinction on stage to see that and it gave sort of this sinister kind of look to the, to the zombie face. So that's what we're doing. Um, you can bring that same kind of uh, shape of a wrinkle up through the brow and it also adds that kind of furrowed look. So just bringing that up maybe ties it in a little bit better for you to see. Um, with this sort of furrowing of the brow, bringing out some crow's feet lines, ties in nicely. And then also the under eye bag works pretty great. So with uh, the under eye bag, sometimes it can get a little bit dark and muddied there. I find if you do sort of this crescent shape and then blend below it, it creates that kind of pooch sort of a, a look. So this is kind of this uh, stripe, crescent stripe there and then you blend below it to pull it down and it gets kind of this like pocket of, of skin look. On the opposite side of the brush from the paint, like just leaving it to blend in? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yep. I will uh, use my brush sort of strategically with the amount of makeup that I have on it. So I do the darkest part of the wrinkle first when I have a lot of makeup on my brush. As I start to run out, I'll use it to blend because there's, I'm not applying any more color. I'm just using this fine tool to help me blend things in. Um, and then I'll move on to a new wrinkle line that needs to be really dark when I have uh, a fresh amount of makeup on. Um, if something is just a little bit too intense, then sometimes I'll do that blotting technique with the sponge to kind of blend it back into the makeup. Just Pressing it with a clean sponge will kind of help settle it in without disrupting what you've done. Uh, blending over uh, wrinkles can really sort of destroy all this lovely fine line work that you've done, but just kind of pressing at it with a blank sponge will settle it down. And sometimes just powder on a, on a powder puff will settle it down enough and you don't need to do anything. So I'm using an empty brush right now and kind of pulling, pulling it down a little bit. look at you. All right. When you're putting finishing powder on like makeup, I've like mm -hmm. had trouble where like I've had a lot of great work done, but then like it all goes away when like the powder comes in. So mm -hmm. do you use the same pat technique with the finishing powder or is it just like you just go near the base and just like kind of let it set? I, I just don't know. 
Yeah, um, pressing the powder into the makeup is what will really set it well. So you just have to be very careful not to do any sort of pulling around as you're pressing um, and just instructing the actors how to do it if they're the ones that are, are doing it. Because I will find people just kind of slap the powder and just let it you know sit and it's not really getting into the makeup. So we will, uh, it's called loading the puff. Do you guys do that technique where you put the powder on, kind of rub it together? Um, and then just really press it into the makeup. And it's a like down and back sort of a technique instead of pulling it, because that's where you start to shift things. Um, you can use a brush to put it on. It just doesn't quite get it in as deeply as when you, you press it on. Just be really careful. Yeah. Is that sort of what you've done before, or? I like pulled, because like there was like so much, there was no time, so like you just, just rub the makeup on, it wasn't really padding, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's where you will alleviate sort of that messing things up problem. <laughs> yeah. I found a lot of problems happen if there's not enough powder on the puff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. If you the are just comes off on. Yeah, it. if you are pressing just an empty puff, or what what you think has powder but is actually an empty puff into the makeup, then it's it's just gonna kind of mess it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, I find it always takes more powder than people think it it takes to get a good coverage, and to to not get like you said the just puff smearing thing Transfer, happening. Yeah. But yes. How do you feel about um, like setting spray for cream makeup? Like yeah. Did, it, did you guys try it Yeah, we used a lot of setting spray. We ended up using some even like store bought ones because we ran out because we had so <laughs> many people. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> um, but I kind of go back and forth in my thoughts on final seal. It's like I think it's working, but I'm not. I, I need to do like a better test, like one arm with it and one arm without. We, we have them do it all the time. And I think for some people it works really well and others maybe they just don't put as, as much on. I let them do it themselves so I don't have a really good clear gauge of how much gets applied onto their face, if that makes sense. Is there another question? I mean, I kind of go off what you said about how there's not enough setting powder on a brush. I think I've had too much, so it looked like as if like it was putting a whole new color on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and with the the setting powder, you can really press a lot of in because it can take your makeup can take a lot of powder, the cream makeup. So <laughs> just keep pressing it into the makeup. If you have way way too much, though, you can dust it off with a like a puffy brush, a big fluffy sort of powder brush. As long as um, as long as you have sort of that base of powder first, so you're not disrupting the whatever design you have underneath. Did you have a question in the back? Uh, oh, no, I was going to kind of go back to, like, do you guys ever just, like, bake? Like, do you know the term baking? I know the term, but I don't think I've done that before. Yeah, so it's just, like, well, essentially you'd be, like, setting powder. Yeah. And you'd, like, put on a kind of heavy coat, and you leave it, and you let it sit for a while. So it essentially bakes, and it kind of, like, helps to hold your makeup, and then you just grab, like, a brush and wipe it off. Okay. And then it usually helps. But it, like she said, you could <coughs> kind of leave a little bit of, like, Whitening. That's kind of what I have like heard of that. A little more, more makeup on top of yeah, it. Just okay. like whatever's left over on the sponge to kind of help like the color sit back in there. Got so it's it. Not like overcast with white or overcast. Yeah, that's um, what I have known with baking is it just does a little bit more of like a highlight on top. Yeah. You tend to do it on the highlight areas mm -hmm. to set it and reinforce that lightness. Yeah. yeah but. Putting makeup on Tom is a great tip. Yeah, any other questions? Because we're at time. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for um, listening to our crazy gray makeup story. Um, <laughs> if you guys have any other questions, I'd be happy to give you my email and chat about makeup and costumes and whatever else you might have questions about. Thank you guys. Thank you.